Hello world, my name is Leo and today we are doing another Thought So Far video. Um, I was considering making another one anyway, but uh, then someone in the comments actually requested um, that I make another one, and the, the first one did seem really well received by everyone. So yeah, here we are with part two of Thought So Far, aka part... Uh, 22.5 if I think I know how the editing is going to go for the remaining videos I haven't edited yet we'll see um but uh yeah the person um who requested it did leave some questions for me to answer so I'm going to be answering those and then I think I'll give my like general thoughts on the lore and uh stuff like that but first I want to say um I just got done recording the video for 600 subscribers, so thank you to everyone uh, for all of the new people who have come for this Let's Play. I really do appreciate all of you, and I don't want to take any of you for granted. So, uh, yeah, just thank you for all of your support and your kind words, and uh, for just experiencing this game with me. Um, and the second thing I want to say is, also, uh, thank you for, uh, sticking with the, like, rule regarding tips and spoilers. I think, um, since I posted the first one of these, and since, uh, like, when I first discovered Looks to the Moon and stuff like that, I think the comments have gotten a lot better, um, in terms of, uh, everyone making sure that any tips and possible spoilers are hidden um, unless I want to read them and I just really appreciate that as well so thank you um, so yeah the uh, questions that were left for me um, so the first one is my thoughts on learning the movement system in this game like the movement tech and it's kind of funny because I I feel like a lot of the movement tech I have just been doing by accident without realizing that it's like movement tech. Like um, when I first started playing the game, I was rolling around and doing those leaps by accident. Apparently how I was doing that was I was like rolling and then like leaping out of the roll. And I just did that because I naturally, like if I move down or if I'm trying to jump to something below me, I naturally... Uh, move the stick like diagonally down because I'm playing on controller um like that's just something that's natural for me so um that was uh it was kind of funny that I did that by accident um I have been noticing I've been doing like a couple of backflips and like quick turns by accident as well um and yeah, I just think it's kind of funny to me that I do all that stuff without realizing it's movement tech. Um, the other thing that is, because I've been doing all of it by accident, I, I don't know if this will make sense, but I don't really know how to do any of it intentionally. And what I mean by that is I don't know exactly what to experiment with further in order to learn anything new because of it. And so I have been, um, I have read a couple of tips when it comes to the movement tech. And uh, there was like, for example, there was one where I hit jump while in a pipe and I accidentally like fell down all the way through the pipe. And uh there was a comment that was left in the video that was like, hey, did you notice that you did this? Um, you should experiment with the jump button in the uh, in the pipes uh, further. And then there was another comment, I think, that said like, hey, you can like boost certain ways in uh, if you're like turning corners if you hit the junk button. And so that that I used that a lot during the uh, during the memory crypts that came in really handy. Um, and so. Um, I think like the movement tech I've been, it's been a combination of me learning stuff by accident and, uh, using tips to kind of help guide me. Um, I think I know myself well enough that I, 
I think I can confidently say that when it comes to movement tech, it's not the type of thing that comes naturally to me. Um, when, when I play games, I, I really like interacting with the world. I really like, um, discovering my own way to play, um, figuring out. And so I, I actually, um, I, I think I said something right at the begin, like within the first few videos, like maybe like at the end of my first recording sessions, like the, at the end of part four or something like that, I said that I could see myself falling into the trap of, I learn a few things that work really well for me, and then I stick with those things and don't really learn much else. And I think I did, to an extent, end up falling into that trap, um, both when it comes to learning the movement tech and when it comes to interacting with, like, experimenting with uh, the animals and how different, um, uh, uh, like, items affect different creatures um and so i think yeah it's been a good balance of me learning stuff naturally by accident and uh like reading the occasional tip here and there uh to help guide me in my experimentation and i think yeah just because learning the fine minutiae of, uh, like, movement tech or, like, um, stuff like that is not something that naturally comes to me as something that, as something to do while playing, if that makes any sense. So, yeah, it's just been, it's just been a good balance, I think. And I love how complex it is. Like, I, I actually, I was talking to someone in the comments and, um, I think it's really cool how complex the movement is because I think what's happening is your the slug cat has the same amount of like physics and animations that a lot of the other creatures do that are procedurally generated. Like that's why uh, a lot of the lizards like sometimes get stuck doing somersaults because um, it's like in their physics to be able to do that and that movement's being procedurally generated. So with the slug cat, you have the same amount of physics or like the same amount of animations, but you are in full control of that. And it gives you a lot more control over the physics than a lot of other games do. And so the types of moves you can do are much more complex than any other than a lot of other games, I should say. Um, so yeah, I, I do think it is incredibly cool that uh, the community... And I'm, yeah, I'm assuming that it was all the community who figured this stuff out. There, This doesn't seem like the game who would have that would have put out a guide as to like, oh, if you do this, you can do this movement. Do this, you can do this movement. No, I'm... It, it, correct, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But... I feel confident. It feels like all of this movement was discovered by the community, just like testing out this the the physics um, while playing the game. And yeah, that's just that's just really cool to me. Um, so the next thing was my thoughts on dealing with the randomness in games of this nature. And this is a pretty easy thing for me, honestly. It. I said in my first uh, Thought So Far video that it felt a little bit like a roguelike. I don't know why I said it like that. Uh, a roguelike where um, you have like procedurally generated uh, enemies from room to room and you just have to adapt to each room. And to an extent, I'm applying the same philosophy here. I, am, I don't know what I'm going to come across every corner, uh, but no matter what, I just have to adapt to it. And that's something that I try to carry with, like, all games in general. Like, all games that I play have different control schemes, different uh, ways of interacting with the world. And one of my philosophies that I apply to all games that I play is that I can eventually work to adapt to all of it. Um, like, that's a little bit what helps me get through, like... Uh, Hollow Knight and the like harder final bosses of games like God of War and stuff like that. Um, I just and like Nier Automata as well. I am just really, 
I don't know if I would say I'm really good at it, but I am used to trying to um, adapt to several different uh, control schemes, environments, um, and yeah, when it comes to roguelikes, that adaptation just has to go a little bit faster because you are things are changing from room to room instead of from game to game. And so, yeah, for this, uh, it's just I have to keep an eye out for what's around every corner. Whenever a new creature comes by, it's like, okay, is there a way for me to get around this? If there isn't a way for me to get around, can I backtrack and find a spear or something to help me uh, get rid of it? Um, or can I, or is there an alternate route that I'm, that I'm able to take? So yeah, dealing with the randomness inherent in games like this, um, I don't know if I want to say it's easy, but it's something that I, it's something that I take in stride. Um, I really enjoy um, adapting to it. It's not something that makes me mad. It's not something that um, I feel like is unfair or anything like that. It's just something that I need to deal with, and I accept that. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's my answer for that one. I hope that answered it uh, effectively. My next, the next thing... The next and final thing that this person wanted to know was effectiveness of systems to make failure less punishing in this game. And I'm assuming what this person means is the effectiveness of like the placement of shelters or uh, like the way you lose karma, but like stay there's, there's only so much karma that you can lose. Um, because this, this is a very punishing game. Like, depending on how you play and depending on how well you play, you can lose a good chunk of progress by dying. Um, and I experienced that, like, in the uh, drainage system. I got repeatedly sent back all the way to the beginning of that region because I kept dying at different points without finding hibernation spots. And, um, I think that for the right kind of player, this game does a good job of letting you know that there is, like, a bottom. Like, there, it, there will always be a point where you can no no matter how bad you do you can no longer get any worse in terms of progression and i think for the right kind of player that really helps because i've i've said it before where like i've hit bottom karma so that 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 means that i can explore and experiment as much as i want without fear of losing anything um i don't think that's effective for all players i think Mo I think some players will find it more frustrating than others, but uh, yeah, for me, it does help mitigate the uh, the sense of like failure that can come from dying over and over. In fact, what's more, what I'm more worried about, like as a let's player, is repeating areas over and over, um, and like recording that and having to like feeling like I'm wasting my time and your guys' time. Like, that is uh, that is something I'm very much aware of as a Let's Player. Like, even, like, as as much support as I get, I am aware that there are going to be sequences that are more, that are more interesting to watch than others. There are always going to be uh, areas that, like, there's only so much of one section that a person might be willing to watch. Um, so I, when I do get stuck and I do end up repeating stuff over and over and I do end up failing, that is something that I'm more aware of. Um, but in terms of the game itself, I think the hibernation spots are pretty well placed for the most part. Like I said, I think the, uh, um, oh, the karma flowers also probably play, play into this. I almost completely forgot about those. Um, I think the karma flowers are a really nice touch, I think. They do provide a sense of security um, for uh, when you're, like, 
traversing. It's always nice to have uh, a flower, um, knowing that you won't lose karma when you die. Um, because the game, at the end of the day, is all about, like, it. it, it is very stressful, and there aren't a lot of things that mitigate that. But the thing, the few things that do mitigate the stress, you feel that a lot more. Um, and so, I don't, I don't know if that answers the question necessarily. The effectiveness of uh, making failure less punishing, I feel like it's all more in how the player feels more than any like gameplay thing because I, I think in terms of gameplay there's not a whole lot that this game does to not be punishing but all of the things that are put in place are more for the player to feel like punishment isn't such a big deal or something like i don't know i don't know does that make sense i i hope it does <laughs> um uh so yeah that is i hope i answered those questions uh effectively and uh like i i hope that i kind of gave the answers that you were looking for thank you to the person who requested those uh who asked those um and so a couple of my own topics that I want to talk about, uh, I did get a couple of comments regarding this. And so I want to, I don't, I just think it would be an, it's an interesting topic to talk about. And, um, I don't want to call out anyone in the comments, um, that is that's the very last thing I want to do. I just uh, I, I just feel like this is a very it, it's come up a couple of times and I feel like it's a very interesting thing to talk about. So I got a couple of comments saying like uh, like asking why I'm playing the way that I am and that I feel uh, it feels like I'm afraid of ev of everything. And um, the. I guess I don't know. I just the number one, the world is just scary. <laughs> like, um, I feel like the world is designed to be stressful and be anxiety inducing. And like I said, in a past video, a lot of the like animations and, and creature designs are made to be like just unsettling enough, um, to provoke a sense of like, not necessarily fear, but I guess anxiety is probably the right word. Um, but other than that, the reason why I play the way that I play is because that is just how I like to interact with the world, I guess. Like, whenever I play games, I tend to get super immersed, and that's why I don't play a lot of horror games. Um, I tend to get very immersed in the games I play, so the fear of inherent in horror games, like, I really feel that. Um, and so, like, the stress of this game, I really feel that as well. And so, um, you know, when... Like I am when I whenever I discover a new creature or something like that, I do tend to approach it with caution and assuming that it is going to hurt me if I get too close. Um, the other reason is I I think that just reflects my general play style overall when it comes to games. I do tend to be a bit more cautious. Um, very rarely do I play aggressively in games. Like, for example, if there is a choice between like a stealth option and a guns blazing option in a game, I'll almost always go with the stealth option. Um, and I am the type of person who like really takes their time and like will wait in one spot for a while to like watch patrols, take uh, like making sure I'm planning out my timing when it comes to each thing, making sure the moment is perfect. And that has led to me like it, it does 
I do overdo it sometimes to where like I, I'm overthinking encounters. But um, I think to some degree the philo- that philosophy is also bleeding into this where I do approach uh, I do approach uh, creatures with a lot more caution. I do tend to watch them uh, more than I interact with them. And um, the interactions that I do have, I like to make sure that I'm like safe to do those interactions before I do them, very rarely will I just, like, run headlong into a creature um, expecting to... Because I know that's probably going to result in death. So, yeah, again, I don't want to, uh, like, call out anyone in the comments. Um, That was just a... Since it came up more than once, I felt like it would be an interesting topic to talk about. Um... So, yeah, and I'm not, like, upset that it happened. Like, at the end of the day, if if people uh, don't like that play style, they, they don't like that play style, and that's, like, it, it is what it is. Um, and I don't, yeah, like, mo- people are interested in watching different things. Um, some people might be interested in more in a certain play style than in a, a different play style. And, yeah, I completely understand that, so, yeah. Everything's all good with that. And um, the last thing I want to talk about is my thoughts on the lore. I think this is the last thing I want to talk about. I'm not sure, but we'll just go with it for now. So uh, when it comes to the lore, I left off. By the time this video comes out, you guys will have seen that I have gone to the precipice. And I had ended that video by saying that I thought that humans were trying to simulate an ecosystem and they were, uh, uh, but the animals had evolved to the point where they ended up killing all the humans, um, and stuff like that. Uh, somehow I, I, my theories have changed a little bit since then, the more I've thought about it. Um, Somehow I got it in my head that all of the ecosystem took place in this mech. Thinking more about that, that's obviously not true because I went from outside of it to inside of it. Um, That doesn't mean like the simulation and stuff is not correct. That still could be correct. I'm just, I was just dumb to assume that like we were all living in a like giant, like metal structure where an ecosystem was being simulated. so yeah, the game is not all taking place in a giant metal structure. It's like outside and then like the structure is separate. Um, the structure could still be controlling the ecosystem though. And to that point, um, I know during my first Thought So Far video, I had talked about how I thought this video or this game might be an allegory for Dante's Inferno and his journey through hell. Um I still don't know if that is true, and I still have not looked up Dante's Inferno to see if any of that holds holds water, but um, I do want to mention another religious story that I think might be relevant here, and I'm surprised I didn't think of it sooner. Um, Noah's Ark and the flood that uh, God sent to essentially reset humanity and rebuild it. Um... So what I'm thinking now is uh, something similar could be happening here where like this machine, this machine is very clearly like it activates at the end of every cycle and there's like the electricity that pulses through it. Like I think I'm in the inner, the reason why I get electrocuted inside the leg and stuff like that is because I'm in the inner mechanisms of whatever this machine is. And so And the machine is so tall that it, like, shades the shaded citadel, which is why it's so dark there. So it's not a far stretch of the the imagination to think that this structure would reach up to the sky. And so I think this structure is what is causing the rain. And I think the rain's purpose, because it rains so violently, I think the purpose of this machine is to attempt to reset the ecosystem. And so I think that when, so humans destroyed the environment and they tried to 
replicate or simulate a functioning ecosystem to, to try to bring it back. But they had this machine and this, like, rain system in place so that if the ecosystem failed, they had an easy reset button. They would just kill everything using the rain and then uh, start over from scratch. But the animals probably evolved so much. Oh, and that's probably why the... Uh, the birds, the mechanical birds, the Miros birds, as you guys have told me that they're called, um, they guard the entrance to this machine because they don't want any animals messing with it. Or like maybe there were people who were trying to mess with it as well. I'm not sure. But um, either way, it got to the point where an the animals became so evolved that they were able to hide from the rain and they were able to kill the humans that were trying to experiment with them. And so now the machine is malfunctioning. There's no way to turn it off. And it just, every so often, it just decides to rain. Um, and so maybe it all... Uh, Maybe the final objective of like all of the campaigns is to try to turn off that machine so it no longer rains. Um, but beyond that, uh, you guys are probably wondering, okay, how does Looks to the Moon fit in with all of this? And I will admit that I saw a couple of things in the comments before I like hard set the rule of hide spoilers and tips under a like read more. Um, I did see a couple of comments that did reveal some things that were wrong about my initial assumptions. Um, and again, I don't want to like, my intention is not to call anyone out. I'm just admitting that I have seen a couple of things and it sucks, but it is what it is. So the things that I've seen, I saw that um, the being is not an alien. It's a robot. Um, and I also saw that looks to the moon is not just the name of the place. It's the name of the robot itself. And those are the only two things that I've seen. I haven't seen anything else, but I felt like I should say that I have seen that stuff. Um, and so my thought is that since it's a robot, um, looks to the moon was probably at one point a structure that was in charge of, uh, like the simulation, the, e the simulating the ecosystem and resetting it. Heck, if I'm imagining the map correctly, because... I had the map all wrong in my head, and so, like, I think what it is is, like, there's the outskirts, industrial complex with the drainage system underneath it, both of which lead to the garbage wastes, and then the garbage wastes underneath, like, the surface go to the shoreline, and then, like, above in the buildings, that's how you get to the Shaded Citadel. And so I can't help but wonder if, if I'm imagining the map correctly, maybe looks to the moon, that structure is the bottom of the leg. Like maybe it's the same structure, just at different heights. Like looks to the moon is the very bottom of it. And then the leg is like the middle of it. Um, and yeah, don't tell me if I'm right about any, about any of this i do want to uh we can discuss whether or not i'm right once i finish survivor but um yeah so i think that looks to the moon might have been in charge of the simulation and to take that a step further i'm wondering if possibly looks to the moon the robot might be possessed by a human soul um, like maybe, uh, and the overseer is like, it's overseeing the last human, um, like a, like a Soma type of situation. I don't know if 
I don't know how many of you guys would have played Soma, but the whole point of that game was uh, um, humans that had transferred their consciousness and by proxy their souls into robots. Um, yeah, and so, like, I'm going out finding these things in order to, like, power the robot back up so that they can regain control of the system and shut off the rain. Maybe. I don't know if that would necessarily happen in this campaign, but yeah, that's my thoughts on the lore so far. Um, <sighs> excuse me. Sorry, I'm very, uh, <laughs> I'm very sleepy. Um, but yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say. Um, I hope all of it was informative. And, uh, yeah, maybe I'll make a third one of these sometime down the line once I play a little bit more, which I'm actually going to do right now. I'm going, right after I get done recording this, I'm going to, uh, start playing the precipice and hope the overseer will give me direction on where to actually go. My biggest fear is that I've passed whatever it is I'm supposed to get. Like, whatever I'm supposed to get is, is still in, like, the leg, and, uh it isn't um in the precipice and i've somehow passed it um but yeah we'll see what happens so yeah thank you everybody so much for checking out this video i hope you enjoyed it um i very much look forward to hearing any of your thoughts on uh anything i've said in the comments and yeah i will see you guys for more rain world in the next video goodbye